All right, let's go ahead and officially dive in. Um, for those who've been early birds, sorry for the repetition here one more time on navigating the workshop. Um, please add your pronouns and organization to your name. Message me directly if you have any access needs, and then feel free to introduce yourself in the chat as we get going. Um, throughout, we welcome questions and comments um, and just ask that you either add them to the chat or when we get to a question section or a discussion that you raise your hand and one of the co-hosts will unmute you. Um, just as a heads up, the slides, recordings, and a summary of all of the discussion today will be made available on the Puget Sound Institute um, website. Um, Rachel, do you mind going back? Great, thank you. Um, so I know, especially many of you are interested in multiple breakouts. Know that if you can't, that we can only be in one, but it's okay because we will have those recordings and summaries available to you all. Just to give you a sense of how we're gonna flow through today, we're gonna have a quick introduction um, then we'll move to talking about the role of the University of Washington Puget Sound Institute. Um, then we'll have Dr. Marta Satula's keynote, which I am very excited about, an opportunity for some Q&A before we make, move into the breakout discussions, and then very briefly come back together to just talk about some next steps there. On that, I'm going to go next slide, please. And want to start before we dive in with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm personally joining today and live on the land of the Duwamish and the Stillaguamish. And want to acknowledge that the work we're doing to try and protect water quality today and, and at Puget Sound Institute builds on the stewardship of tribes since time immemorial. Um, and that it is a central piece of our accountability to tribes um, throughout the Salish Sea. The other piece I want to acknowledge is that both personally and at Puget Sound Institute and in the science community more broadly, that there is still a lot more work we all have to do in terms of building relationships with tribes and in centering uh, tribes and indigenous knowledge in science to protect water quality. So definitely an evolving um, learning space. With that, let's go next slide. And I will turn it over to Joel, who's the director. Thank you, Marianne. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled you're all here so early in the morning um, and we're having this, this workshop. I just want to say a few words about why we're here and what our role is at the Puget Sound Institute. I think many of you know us, but just to, to get, get the wheels turning here this morning. Um, the University of Washington's Puget Sound Institute is now 10 years old. We were um, started really kind of at the outset of the Puget Sound Partnership being formed shortly thereafter. And our role is pretty simple. It's to, it's to serve as the interface between the science and policy communities in the, in the Puget Sound region. Um, and we do this by synthesizing and integrating the latest peer-reviewed research coming out of the research centers in our region and beyond. Um, and working closely with the policy community and the managers to so that we understand the, to the best of our ability what their questions are, what their issues that they're faced with, and then also be able to talk to the science community to see like what the matchmaking is between the, the latest science and, and, and those issues. Um, so most of what we do is synthesize and integrate other people's information. So it's incredibly valuable to us to have uh, good ties to the science community and, and be able to hold workshops like this. The other thing that is important to Puget Sound Institute and is more, a little bit more chronic and a little less obvious is that we foster and maintain the open, transparent, and frankly, fun science community in the Puget Sound region. I think those of us on the call, those, you know, get into the science profession because it's a lot of fun, it's interesting, and, you know, the Puget Sound is a very complicated puzzle to be solved, and I think those of us who are problem solvers and are just fascinated by how natural systems work. Um, we enjoy working in communities and communities um, spanning the range of um, different organizations, different geographic locations, but we learn from each other um, and nothing is better than being in a science workshop and exchanging ideas and talking, talking to each other. So that is what we're, um, that's, that's what we're all about. Recently, um, well, I just say in the Puget Sound Institute, our work is supported by a number of organizations, including federal agencies, state agencies, local governments. Um, the work that we do is um, 
supported by external sources, but the work is ours. We're, we hold dear our independent voice and the products and conclusions that come from the Free Design Institute are always our own products and conclusions. They're not influenced by our sources of funding or any other um, issues. Recently, in the last several years, as many of you know, we, the Puget Sound Institute, has been working with the National Estuary Program and EPA um, and our state partners in developing the, the implementation strategies around a number of topics. And Puget Sound Institute has been involved in a number of these. Um, they're listed on the slide. Shoreline armoring, um, benthic index of biotic integrity, which is the, the marker for freshwater quality, land development and cover, toxics and fish, and marine water quality. So. Today we're talking about marine water quality, but I just want to make the point that Puget Sound Institute, this role that we're playing in marine water quality is very similar to the role we've played in and continue to play in the other <laughs> strategies in the region. So this isn't a, a unique, distinctive thing for us to be doing. Hey, Jeremy, um, come on, on record. Can you Stefano, can you mute, please? Yeah. Stefano, please mute. Thank you. Um, so that's who we are and, and, and why we're here. Um, and we'll say more about this later. So I, that's just the kickoff. I wanted to um, introduce our, one of our partners, Rebecca Singer from King County to say a few words. If Rebecca's on. Rebecca, you should be able to unmute yourself and turn on your video at this point. Okay, uh, is this working now? Apologies yes, everyone. <laughs> no worries. Well, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, like Joel said, King County is just really happy to be sponsoring the PSI series. Um, and we're hoping to share our experiences and expertise around the, or, you know, from around the country and advance our knowledge about the conditions in Puget Sound. Um, we live in such a unique area. We just feel that it needs to be uh, better understood by all of us who are trying to improve water quality. Um, the, this work is something that the region, our entire region recognizes as a need uh, just to better understand that unique ecosystem. And we encourage everyone's participation um, as we further our scientific understanding. Uh, today's presentation is the opening session of a series of workshops that will take us through the fall and the topics presented over the course of the series <laughs> we'll provide a range of information from tools to how do we assess water quality to understanding the biological impacts of climate change on Puget Sound. Uh, this work is a collaboration among many partners across the Sound. A few of them are just Puget Sound Clean Water Alliance, King County, City of Tacoma, City of Everett, and others. And we thank you for your participation today, and we really look forward to learning more about this very important issue with all of you who share our desire to protect waters um, and the place that we call home. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Stefano Mazzilli from Puget Sound Institute, who will provide some background. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I'd like to provide a little bit of framing um, and a background on the workshop series and particularly um, that specific role of, of PSI. Um, and that includes some of the parallel modeling activities that we'll be undertaking. And what we hope participants will get out of uh, these workshop series and today's meeting. Um, next slide, please. So there are three driving questions um, to the use of models. Uh, in nutrient reduction strategies and planning that overarch uh, the technical uncertainties that were raised in uh, the Puget Sound Partnership Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy that Joel mentioned earlier. Um, many of you have been involved as scientific advisors on this process, and it's really intended as a follow-up uh, to address those uncertainties. So overarching these are these driving questions of what are the natural and anthropogenic nutrient loads uh, to Puget Sound? What are the ecosystem impacts of those loads? And then related to both, how confident are we in um, modeling the consequences of change? Um, our approach really here 
is twofold. How can we reduce the uncertainties and improve the confidence in predictions to support actions now? And then longer term, uh, to identify gaps um, in future combined modeling and monitoring. Next slide, please. So the partnership strategies and science plans follow an adaptive management approach. They each have feedback loops on the planning and implementation stages um, that are supported by the science. And therefore, each benefits from this iterative modeling and monitoring approach, particularly if we're trying to address system level questions. Next slide, please. Um, so it's an important component of the next steps in the science supporting the marine water quality implementation strategy, uh, which is shown on the top, where we go from identified uncertainties to looking at hypotheses of change that are being discussed currently in the monitoring uh, community using long-term data sets, testing these hypotheses with numeric or other models at the bottom here, and then using this uh, model analysis to identify knowledge gaps and finally to iterate with improved planning and strategy and ultimately confidence in the model scenario applications. Next slide, please. So um, from the implementation strategy for the marine water quality, there were 70 or so technical uncertainties and associated research actions. Um, and these were identified across all of the reduction strategies within, within the plan. This work funded by King County is to provide specifically um, support uh, towards the goal of following up on refining these, addressing them with further modeling efforts. This is not a discussion on the standard, um, but on the science that supports the decision making. Um, and we recognize it's difficult um, to collaborate at this stage uh, with the current litigation. However, uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, however, we expect that we can get um, some clear consensus across a number of points. Um, firstly and, and foremost is on the application um, of these models and confidence in that. Um, so collectively, these uncertainties are the focus of what we'll be discussing across each of the theme workshops starting in the fall. And these are shown on the right. Um, and they range from the impacts on biological integrity through to the development of uh, couple watershed models and the associated uncertainties with those. Um, most of these today have a breakout uh, session with a short presentation and an opportunity to start these discussions. The current work also includes three complementary areas uh, where PSI and the Salish Sea Modeling Center further collaborate um, with the broader nutrient science um, community efforts. Next slide. Uh, so these are list listed on the left. First, there's the, mon the uh, model evaluation group, uh, which is convened to independently evaluate um, the uh, application of the Salish Sea model. Um, and that, for example, is to define targeted runs that can evaluate the sensitivity and relative uncertainty contribution of model components of, say, sediment exchange and ocean influence. Um, it is not to evaluate the regulatory standard or nor a full audit of the Salish Sea model itself. And I would refer you to the publications um, by our colleagues at Ecology in the, in the modeling team, as well as Terang Kangonkar's group heading up the Salish Sea Model and the Salish Sea Modeling Center. Um, so each member of the MEG or the Monitoring and Evaluation Group, Modeling Evaluation Group, brings a valuable perspective on facing similar challenges of applied numerical uh, water quality modeling from elsewhere. You can find out more about each of them and their interests um, from the information sent earlier and, and on our website. But briefly, it's led by uh, Bill Dennison and Jakob Kastensen. Uh, Bill chairs the science and technology assessment team at Chesapeake Bay, and Jakob Kasten leads the Baltic uh, Nest Institute, which technically backstops uh, countries' engagement in the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And his focus is specifically on the impacts and drivers of hypoxia and low DO. Um, in addition, uh, Jeremy Tester, 
also works um, on numerical modeling in, in the Chesapeake Bay program and focuses specifically on the biogeochemistry and predictive uncertainties. Uh, Kevin Farley um, is in the New York, um, New Jersey Harbor Astronaut program and leads on engagement in uh, water quality modeling reviews, as well as toxics nationally and internationally. And lastly, Peter um, Van Rolham uh, works on fjords um, of East, Eastern Canada and also chairs the uh, Water Environment Federation a modeling expert group and a similar uh, Canadian chair position on water quality. Um, second here, there are a number of complementary modeling run efforts by the state and others uh, that you'll hear about and engage with, uh, hopefully through these forums. We and others will be particularly undertaking model runs to address targeted technical uncertainties that come out of these processes. Uh, we'll be supporting the wider access to model and model outputs through the Salish Sea Modeling Center, particularly, um, which has already been uh, stood up and supported by municipalities of the Puget Sound Clean Water Alliance. Um, and this includes the city of Tacoma. Um, the last component of work here uh, is the synthesis of the scientific discussions that are coming out of all of this for a wider audience. And that's through the various channels, uh, which you can see shown on the right here. You can find out more about them through the Puget Sound Institute website and also through the blog updates. Uh, most importantly, with this component, we're providing space for a public facing um, engagement through webinars. And that's specifically uh, to, to synthesize the insights for decision makers, um, such as council members. Um, next slide, please. And so with that, I'll hand back to Joel, but I just want to say on today's meeting, um, the intention of having Marta's presentation on the keynote and having each of these theme breakouts is really to, to get folks excited about the opportunities and the expansion of, of work in modeling ahead, um, to set a collaborative tone, and then to continue the regional discussions um, like that have occurred earlier, in these forums where these technical uncertainties were identified. Um, the breakout sessions themselves are a taster that can really just jumpstart conversations that we hope to dive deeper into the fall. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Joel. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Um, and there'll be time for questions and discussions about what you've heard so far after Martha's presentation. So I'm thrilled that Martha still has agreed to join us today. Um, we with the Puget Sound Institute and all of you, I think, enjoy hearing experiences from other parts of the world. Um, although our system is very special to us, um, I think we recognize as scientists that there's some, some commonalities among different estuaries around the world and different coastal systems around the world. So it's always good to pick other people's brains and um, learn, learn what they've experienced. And uh, we're, we're pleased that Martha's here. Martha is the head of the Southern California Coastal Water Research Projects Biogeochemistry Department. Um, and her she oversees projects related to the effects of climate change and anthropogenic pollution on hypoxia, acidification, harmful out blooms, and eutrophication. Should sound familiar to all of you. Um, she is also um, provides a lot of advisory work for the state of California and the regional uh, government agencies there as well. Um, and she's been at, at Squirt since uh, 2001. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Martha. Good morning and welcome to the Northwest. Good morning. Thanks so much. And it's a real, it's a pleasure and honor to be asked to give the keynote today. Um, I'm, I really appreciate the challenges and, and the energy um, that it requires to get this conversation going because we've been essentially you know, working on the same um, sorts of questions um, along the California coast. And so I think it's it's a great opportunity for me to share a little bit of what we're interested um, in, what we're working on. And I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, hold on one second. And, um, and I hope that what I uh, share with you guys is useful and I look forward to the conversations. <laughs> So give me just a second. Can everyone see that? The, are you looking at the right screen? <laughs> yes, that's perfect. Yes, Thanks, Martha. Martha. Okay, great. All right. So what I'm going to be talking about today is essentially um, the process uh, uh, for how we assemble a conversation 
uh, um, to work towards solutions to addressing climate change and cultural, um, coastal eutrophication stress on the near shore ecosystems in the Southern California Bight, which is essentially where I, where I work. Um, and so let me jump in. So as context for this, I'm sure a lot of you are really aware of the fact that um, the, the Pacific West Coast is really stressed out from climate change. So climate change is not something that's in the future. It's, it's already here. It's already, um, we're already seeing levels of acidification, of oxygen loss, of um, warming and harmful algal blooms that are having significant impacts on our biological resources and on the communities that depend on them. Um, and so ultimately, um, this is an important starting point um, for the motivation for California to try to start to have conversations about what, what can we meaningfully do about this? What can we do? How can we act locally to start to counteract and build resilience of our ecosystems to these types of, uh, these types of stressors? And so in having those conversations, I think what's clear to me is that water quality managers, as they get in on the game, to, um, to start to partner with, um, with marine or estuarine resource managers on these questions is that we really share many of the same challenges with you guys. There's a tremendous variability if you think about the Puget Sound coastline or the California coastline. There's a tremendous variability in the pollution inputs, the circulation um, of the coastline that controls ultimately the fate and transport of those inputs and their biological effects on the climate and on the biological communities that are actually really sort of key for how the, the impacts are manifest. And so what's clear first of all, first of all is a one, one size fits all solution does not work. And the potential cost of this is such that it's really important to understand how do we have place-based conversations about these challenges. So as we realize that, we also um, are sort of staring at the fact that we have limited long-term support for monitoring and modeling that have that can inform management actions now, um, as well as when we think about the monitoring data that we do have, it tends to be most rich in the physics and to a lesser extent on the chemistry. And the, what is probably the most scarce is the um, understanding of what's happening with our biological communities. So where do you, where and when do you see these impacts? Um, and so ultimately, these are grand scientific challenges. Um, at the same time, um, we're all struggling with the fact that we have um, dated water quality goals. Many of them were created back in the time that the Clean Water Act was um, was promulgated. Um, that have served us well, but in in I think our brave new world of climate change, um, we understand that don't quite fit the bill. They don't relate to biological effects, and so so even though we have sort of some limited kind of clarity on the goals that we're trying to manage towards. At the same time, we also have, I think what everyone really recognizes in California is a real urgency to act quickly. Um, and that's further challenged by the fact that we have multiple jurisdictions. I'm sure you guys know all about this, as well as a lack of buy-in on the vision for solutions and the way forward, especially if we tend to put the burden of those solutions on the backs of the regulated community. Um, and they have not necessarily always bought in that they're the real cause of the problem. So if this sounds familiar, you guys are not alone. So what I wanna talk about today is, I guess I'll use the Southern California Bite as a case study to talk about what, what is the way that we can structure a conversation um, to begin to make movement towards finding um, solutions to increase coastal resilience to global climate change or local eutrophication stress. And so I have six points that I'm gonna be walking through today. Um, and so I won't repeat them now, but um, what I, I think the message to you guys is that it's really about the process for how you assemble um, your partners, how you assemble your tools, um, 
and how you can um, work together to have the conversations that can ultimately um, lead you towards cost-effective solutions for the problems that you're trying to identify. So let me take you down all the way south along our coastline to the Southern California Bight. So this is um, a marine open embayment. It has roughly a population of about 20 million people. And so when we started to um, think about in California, this idea of trying to um, manage local pollution stressors um, to, to address climate change, this was sort of a, this was a fun test case for us to, to start, obviously in my own backyard. Um, we have 20 million people who live in the, along the coastline. We have a number of wastewater and stormwater um, inputs along the coast. Um, and, but ultimately what's important to understand when I got here about, when I um, wrapped up my postdoc and came here about 20 years ago, is that the predominant sort of opinion is that the inputs from, from the wastewater and the stormwater from 20 million people could not be um, in any way close to the magnitude of a natural source upwelling along the coastline. And so it, it's been an interesting um, effort to look more deeply at the science, um, especially if I'm coming from the Gulf Coast where, where we understood that nutrients can have a big effect on pushing harmful algal blooms, coastal hypoxia, um, and, and moving us an ecosystem towards um, ecological tipping points. So these opposing views is, I think, I, is something that we that I personally encountered 20 years ago. And then ultimately, I think what's really important is that if we were able to identify that that nutrients um, were having um, some sort of effect along the coastline, the solution which um, people would sort of normally go towards is nutrient management. And what we understand is that's gonna be, that would, to manage nutrients, it would cost billions of dollars. So the, ultimately, I think the question we were faced with when we started to tackle the science question is, um, are nutrients having an impact? And is, is this, it, you know, it, is investing billions of dollars in wastewater upgrades something that's really needed? <clears throat> Well, in order to tackle this question, I think that, first of all, um, one of the essential ingredients, and I really like to start here in telling our story, is that it's really essentially to have, um, essential to have willing partners at the federal level, the state and, and regional or local to invest in the science and the management conversations that are needed to explore solutions. And California has been um, really attempting to lead the way on, on these conversations through the Ocean Protection Council, which is the coordinating agency for the, for the Natural Resources Agency that ultimately coordinates um, marine policy. And they have put out a number of documents that highlighted the strategies um, that, that they thought would be important to tackle in order to come up with solutions. And in particular, this investigation of local pollution sources, um, the need to sequester carbon through habitat restoration, and in doing so, in order to really guide those actions, the creation of biologically relevant acidification and oxygen uh, water quality uh, criteria. And that the, the OPC's efforts were further I think clarified and sharpened by clear directives on science and research from a West Coast um, ocean acidification and hypoxia expert panel. And they advised all of our West Coast states to invest in ocean or um, N-estrin numerical modeling that would help to disentangle the contributions of climate change, natural variability and local pollution as well as um, ultimately, um, and in, in heeding that call, then the states have really partnered with NOAA to make the, the investments in coastal numerical um, models and push them from sort of purely physical models towards um, biogeochemical and low, um, lower trophic ecosystem models. So in Southern California, I think another part of this sort of willing partnership is we have a 50-year partnership of regulated water, um, uh, uh, 
water quality agencies, the regulators, US EPA, Cal P, um, EPA, as well as the Ocean Protection Council that have been working and have this precedent of working together to identify uh, key regional science questions, cooperative, cooperatively fund modeling, research and monitoring, and really working to get consensus on the interpretation of that science, what's driving the problem, agreeing on the interpretation framework, uh, water quality goals, um, as well as what are the potential solutions. And in doing so, getting the managers together has also really been an, an informal mechanism to build trust and engage in policy discussions. And that's what really my institute has been trying to serve as that mechanism to pull these people together um, and to um, allow or facilitate to help, help them have those conversations. So if the first ingredient is willing partners, then let's move and talk about the tools that we need and numerical models, whether they're estuarine or ocean um, that are mechanistic, hind casting and that have the ability to um, really help us investigate uh, scenarios are an important uh, tool for how we have these conversations. And then the Southern California Bite or along the California Southern California Current are, are the model that we've invested in is essentially one that is a physical model um, that's uh, the basis for which is called the Regional Ocean Modeling System or ROMS, coupled to a bio, biogeochemical elemental cycling model, which is essentially a, a model that tracks the fate of nutrients and how they move through the lower ecosystem. They're uptaken by phytoplankton, which are grazed by zooplankton, and then ultimately impacting dissolved oxygen and pH. And that the way that this particular model is plumbed, understanding how important it is to capture the physical ocean circulation, and at the same time, the inputs from the coastline, this has a, it's a nested model that scales from Cal, the entire California current at four kilometers resolution, all the way down to a one kilometer resolution at the coastline to 300 meters along the Southern California Bight which is the scale at which we then input into the model a compilation of river runoff, POTW or municipal wastewater ocean outfalls, uh, wet and dry atmospheric deposition, as well as modeled um, CO2, um, uh, atmospheric CO2. So this is our tool of choice um, and that we can use then to begin to investigate place-based solutions. And when we apply this model, I'll sort of jump forward. Um, we wrote a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science um, uh, last year, in which we demonstrated that the wastewater inputs and the um, riverine inputs, so land-based inputs of 20 million people coming um, into the coastline are essentially amplifying the algal biomass and its primary productivity, and increasing subsurface pH loss and oxygen loss in the Southern California Bight. So this is sort of moving from this sort of uh, question whether or not nutrients could have an impact and now demonstrating that they are indeed having an impact. Um, but the question is, this is just chemistry. Can, is this something that's really significant? And so this essentially started to accelerate our conversations. And so at the same time, when we were doing the science to evaluate the, um, the effect of those land-based nutrients, we also spent a long time, we the modelers, that is, uh, trying to validate these models. And we did this first at the West Coast wide scale to really make sure that we are capturing appropriately ocean forcing all the way down to within the Southern California Bight to the plume and sub-regional scales that are essentially capturing um, and our ability to reproduce gradients of subsurface oxygen and pH loss. So what's really important then is that 
um, if you're going to start applying these models to support man management com conversations, is that for any particular application, then that the that the model uncertainty is constrained. And we thought as we took the first cut at this that we were done. Um, but ultimately, um, our stakeholders really pushed back and um, really wanted to make sure that they were able to weigh in and actually specify the metrics and gradients that they thought were really important to run this model through its paces in order to make sure that the model was credible for these um, uh, pollution, pollution applications within the Southern California Bight. And so we took the time um, to work with them. We, first of all, um, really worked with them to compile all of their data. We agreed on the relevant list of anthropogenic gradients, the indicators and the metrics. We worked with them on the interpretation of that, invalid, um, that, that validation. And so in doing this, I think we built goodwill um, but they still wanted us to go farther. They wanted to understand more about model uncertainty. And so in doing that, we invested in stakeholder education last summer through a workshop on modeling uncertainty. And I think that it's been a, um, a process to get our um, stakeholders on board with this model. I don't think we're there yet, actually. But I thought what was really interesting when we had this workshop in which we pulled together a number of notable um, scientists and modelers uh, and managers who from different parts of the world have been in, um, uh, investing in the use of models to guide management conversations, that some of the things that, um, some of the things were not surprising, for example, in their recommendations, do an ongoing skill assessment of the model. That's not so surprising. But other things were, um, I, were I was um, anticipating less. And there was a lot of um, emphasis in investing in and maintaining an open dialogue as being critically important to improve management confidence in models. So they have to be kind of open book to invest in and maintain long-term chemical and biological model um, monitoring as a way to be able to um, really support that ongoing model validation. And other things um, that they thought were really important, for example, that managers should really provide a clear guidance on the interpretation framework, so essentially the water quality goals that the model would be using to interpret essentially the, um, the biological effects of anthropogenic nutrients and ultimately how um, effective those solutions were. And I think that that's sort of an important pivot point, at least in this talk, ultimately, because um, the, the next part, solution is having sort of a clear set of those water quality goals and in particular of uh, thresholds of biological impacts. And the reason why, you know, ultimately um, you haven't heard about any management decisions in Southern California at this, point, at this point is because our managers in looking at the science that we've done so far said, it's not enough just to document chemical changes. We'd really like to understand how these chemical changes are being manifest in biological effects. And the problem that California have and, and that many people have along the coastline is that our existing water quality objectives or criteria um, are not really plug and play um, for this type of application. Our numeric pH and dissolved oxygen water quality criteria are intended to be end of pipe um, and really more focus um, at, at industrial and municipal wastewater discharges and their very, um, I, I guess I'll say plume scale effects. Um, and whereas our biological and um, integrity water quality objectives could be used, they're narrative. And so they don't provide us with a lot of guidance for, for how do we interpret this. And so at the same time that we are running this modeling program, then um, uh, the, our community of scientists have really started to invest in essentially the science um, to assess biological effects. And when we think about the work that goes into this, there's really sort of three major components. Number one, um, the work to, um, to identify or synthesize thresholds or indices that can be the in important interpretive 
frameworks, through laboratory experiments, through field observations, through data synthesis and experts consensus, and then and how that ultimately is used to generate thresholds or multi-stressor indices. There's a second step in which we need to get consensus on how those um, indices or thresholds are applied to model output or to, or to observations, um, which is not always as straightforward as you would think. And there's actually a lot of policy decisions embedded in them. And then ultimately, as we make predictions, for example, what you see on the bottom here is a prediction of the time um, below um, a uh, dissolution threshold for pteropods. What a lot of people want to know is, well, is that real? So ultimately, we really have to come back and not only validate our models, but also validate the predictions on biological effects. And we do that by having coupled chemical biological effects observations. But ultimately, just having the science alone is not enough. You also really need to establish a process and a clear set of science and policy questions that would guide that target setting. So what, and here's a really, here's a good example of some of those types of questions that we've been working on um, with our managers in concert with scientists along the coastline. So for example, if you're thinking about oxygen or pH targets, what metric would you use? Are you gonna use for oxygen? We could talk about percent saturation or, or partial pressure of O2 or concentration. Should you worry about multiple stressors, things like um, uh, how these responses can co-vary with things like temperature? Uh, what threshold um, should you be uh, choosing? And you want to go almost immediately to what level of severity. A lot of us talk about hypoxia, but by the time you're sort of killing organisms, you may have gone too far. And what about sublethal effects? And ultimately, um, what habitat and what taxa and what data should be used to derive those thresholds? And so once you start to kind of synthesize this, what you understand immediately as you start to try to apply these thresholds is that you really need to specify the duration and the spatial and temporal scales used to apply those thresholds. And then ultimately, because low oxygen and low pH exist in nature, there is a natural background variability um, in which you would expect to um, um, not meet those thresholds is then, is there some acceptable frequency of deviation based on some natural um, background or reference condition? And what's, what, what happens when you start to lay out these questions in this way, you can really identify what are the technical questions that scientists need to weigh on and what are the um, questions or issues that are, that are policy decisions um, that, need to be, um, that need to be essentially guided and so I'm looking at my time and I think I'm going to sort of accelerate through this. Ultimately, what I think what I want to tell you guys is that um, in order to, um, we haven't gotten this guidance from our managers yet. We haven't, we don't have the clarity in our interpretation framework. And so that our science team has actually constructed essentially a synthesis of thresholds in order to be able to um, essentially illustrate how the choices in thresholds of acidification or oxygen loss can ultimately um, uh, impact the results or finding of, of, what we, uh, of, of what we're demonstrating as anthropogenic effects. And I'll move past these two slides and uh, just to kind of be able to wrap up quickly. Um, and so when we apply these thresholds, we're essentially then um, looking at our change metric of habitat compression. So this is different than sort of a percent change in, in natural background. We're actually looking at the compression of habitats um, in the Southern California Bight as a result of anthropogenic or land-based inputs. And then when we're, as we're showing these results to our managers, what, what we are already talking about is how important it is to get consensus on the indicator organisms um, that we think are important, that are representative of the impacts that we're seeing, and to be continuously investing in coupled chemical and biological monitoring um, in order to really, again, validate uh, these impacts 
and essentially give um, a, some sort of constraint to the uncertainty of the effects that, that we're predicting. Um, in, our, in my last point, the last um, sort of ingredient of the solution is that I think it's really important that we not just focus on nutrients, um, that there are innovative options out there that are beyond nutrient management alone. They can be living solutions that enhance coastal resiliency, for example, restoration of seagrass and kelp, or even aquaculture that can be a, an important part of how we can remove nutrients from the systems. Um, and we also should look more broadly at how we are managing um, the water resource that's a part of our, of our waste streams so that we can be looking for any opportunity for source reduction and to be essentially um, building our, our, the resiliency of our communities towards, towards um, climate change. And because you folks are really struggling um, with sort of this question of, of estuaries, what I really wanted to sort of highlight, even though my, my talk is focused on the coast, is that, you know, I think I've been trying to help people understand how important it is to incentivize watershed and estuarine restoration, um, in which we're essentially rebuilding um, and restoring the natural um, geomorphology um, and the hydrology that, of these systems that are that can really contribute towards eutrophication. So it's not just a nutrient loading problem, it's also a physical habitat disturbance, a hydro modification problem. So we should think more broadly about what these solutions can be. And so, um, so what I'm, uh, this is my last slide and I'm wrapping up, um, you know, pointing to the fact that we have many shared challenges and that we also have, um, I think a common process for how we assemble a conversation in order to begin to look for meaningful solutions to build uh, coastal resilience. And so I'll stop there and see what I've done to your agenda. <laughs> thank you very much, Martha. You have made our agenda fantastic is what you've done to the agenda. So thank you. That was very interesting and certainly resonates with me and I'm sure other, other people on, on the call. We do have time for questions. Um, what I would suggest is we open it up and you use the hand raise function if you have a question. I will try to spot you and call on you in order and um, please turn your camera on and close your microphone for that. We'll take questions from Martha first and then we'll open it up to more broad questions from Stefano and I as well if, if we have time. And Mario, we're doing this till 9.10. Does that sound about right Correct. to you? Correct. And I'm seeing Wendy Stephenson has her hand up first. Wendy, are you, do you have a question? And Martha, maybe you can stop sharing your slide. Oh, sure, happy to do that. And then Greg, you're on deck, Greg Hood's on deck. Good morning, Wendy. All right, <laughs> thanks, I can now unmute. Um, so the question is, how do you square the, the very short time period in which we need to act with the longer time period that it takes to develop biologically relevant standards? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really good question. And since we're not quite through it, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer, but I think I see how it's proceeding, which is um, maybe the first answer is that our water quality managers um, don't always necessarily um, feel that they need to have revised standards in order to proceed with a management action um, in which the science um, of biological effects is compelling in which there's a strong linkage between those impacts and um, something that they feel is within their jurisdiction. And so what I think is, you know, what the way this is proceeding in the Southern Cal in Southern California is we've assembled um, science to essentially help to illustrate um, those linkages. And the managers are considering whether or how uh, to act. 
on the basis of that. And so I guess the short answer is um, you don't always, at least in California, necessarily have to go all the way through the rulemaking process to update your water quality objectives. Um, even though I think ultimately it, it would, it's helpful if you can. Um, but there are some shorter term actions that be, that can be taken on the basis of published science. And so are there some risks to that? Yeah, I think so, because I think it hasn't gone through the public process. And so I think that, again, we're sort of bat battling between the need to give that public process its due and to actually do the science and to take meaningful action on the basis of what we're already seeing is through some tremendous impacts along our coastline. So that's a great question. Um, and I guess stay tuned because we haven't made any decisions yet. <laughs> Wendy, does that help? Maybe think that was it. Just a point of clarification, uh, Martha, when you say the managers, who's sitting around that table? Who's, who's the managers in those senses? Um, the managers are- Who they represent probably, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's essentially Cal EPA. So that's the state water board. And the um, uh, we, there are nine in California, nine semi-autonomous semi we, um, regional water boards that are actually responsible for implementing that policy. It's EPA, it's the, um, the wastewater or sanitary agencies and the stormwater agencies. Um, and then because they coordinate ocean policy, the Ocean Protection Council also has a seat at that table. And so these are the folks that are actively having this conversation now. Um, and um, we're still in the process of wrapping up the science that they're hoping to use to make a decision about, about whether to manage nutrients in the Southern California Bay. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Um, Greg Hood and then Gordon Holgrief. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have kind of a, a general observation or maybe, um, uh, I guess maybe a general question I kind of like your response to, and that is I'm a, I'm a tidal marsh biologist. And so I, I came to this, uh, this morning's uh, talk, really interested in how nutrient pollution affects tidal marshes. I don't. I. I'm. I'm really focused. I'm. I'm an ecologist. I'm not really a much of a nutrient person. So I came here to learn. <laughs> and 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 I noticed from your talk that there seems to be a lot of emphasis on kind of planktonic responses. I hope. I hope I'm not misunderstanding that. And 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 it seems to be maybe from some some areas not much of a of a, a focus at least historically. On kind of vascular plant responses, and I'm and I'm interested in, in what it, what appears to be happening in the Skagit Delta where I work, which is that we have a lot of non-native cattails that are expanding over the last decades, and are continuing to do so, and and so my my suspicion is that um, agricultural pollution in the Delta is, is is responsible for that, and I also know from the literature that uh, nitrogen pollution in particular affects the 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 shoot. Uh, and root ratios, it, it diminishes the, the, the um, amount of, of effort by the plants that they expend to, to root growth. And as a result, the, the tidal marshes are more um, vulnerable to erosion uh, by storm waves. So, so I just, I just, I'm kind of interested in your response to kind of shifting a focus away from from plankton, which are very important, of course, I, I don't want to mean to diminish that, but to a, a broader um, response by by of various ecosystems. So thanks, Greg, and I think that that's a great question because I'll ultimately, in speaking to an audience like this, you know, there are lots of folks that are looking in different places, and I think the quick answer to your question is that yes. We have, um, you know, there's a, a large part of our research program at SCORP and our partnership with UCLA and Princeton that have been focused on the nearshore ecosystems, but I've also spent 20 years of my career um, looking at um, the effects of eutrophication on, on estuaries and coastal wetlands. And I think some of the best science that I've seen generated from California has actually um, been done um, by uh, 
Kristen Wasson um, at Elkhorn SLU on this topic, in which she's basically, you know, demonstrated the effect that um, eutrophication and um, and macroalgal um, blooms can actually have on the structural integrity of tidal marshes. And so, in giving this talk, um, I didn't attempt to sort of try to forget about um, those nutrient impacts. It's, uh, but ultimately, in order to tell the story and make the point that I wanted to, it's really about the process. And number one, agreeing on, I think, you know, what the problem looks like. And I think that that's also, also one of the biggest challenges. And I think in the kind of science of eutrophication, there's probably been um, uh, less emphasis on vascular, you know, emergent marsh. Um, uh, relative to some of the other um, pathways, but in, in, the, in the last decade, there's really been quite um, quite an advance. And so we could probably talk offline ab about that science a little bit more, but those impacts are there and it's something that people are worrying about. Great, thanks. Uh, Parker, McCready, and then Bob Black. Oh, I'm Gordon, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's get to record. <laughs> it's, a, it's okay. Um, hey, I was distracted thanks, by your Martha. Mistake. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, Martha, uh, thanks for your talk. It was it was really excellent. And my name is Gordon Holcroft. I'm with the University of Washington. I wanted to dig in a little bit on uncertainty and kind of your approaches to uncertainty, and just ask the question: When you guys are are dealing with uncertainty, are you kind of approaching it from the perspective of, okay, we've we understand the uncertainty and we think it's good enough, and therefore we're going to just kind of go forward and leave the uncertainty issue behind? Or is the approach more one that's maybe more probabilistic where you would say, you know, we, we know there's uncertainty, all models have uncertainty and we provide our best estimate of X and we have probability Y that we're wrong about that estimate and then carry that forward into decision-making where you could say, okay, here's what we, if you did management action here, this management action, we think this is going to be the outcome, but there's a 10% chance that doesn't materialize, 15% chance, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Or is it kind of more, yeah, good enough, not good enough? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I'm, I think that the, the answer is oftentimes it's a little bit of both. I think you need to at least, you know, meet a bar that your model, your model is credible for a certain application. Um, but ultimately then once you've sort of moved past that point and um, you're reaching sort of a stage in which at least a, um, a set of managers are accepting your model and want to use it um, for a certain application like regulating nutrients, then I think the, um, the near term sort of focus becomes really doing um, a credible job in, in being able to describe as well as possible what is the uncertainty um, associated with the application of that model and its predictions for that, um, you know, for the question of the day. So, you know, if we're talking about anthropogenic nutrients. And it's interesting because we've done model, we've done model validation. Um, we've had a workshop and talked about, you know, what else we can do, but ultimately, you know, we're still coming up right now um, with another set of analyses that um, our managers, in particular, um, the regulated community want to see to help better constrain um, how interpretable our model results are, you know, so if we're talking about impacts, is 5% something that we can, um, is a 5% difference something that we can interpret? Does it need to be 10 or 15? So um, we're still really trying to um, provide an accurate description of the interpretability um, and the magnitude of change in order to be able to sort of drive this. Um, but there is probably a difference of opinion among managers um, how far we have to go in characterizing that uncertainty relative to how quickly they would like to be able to make a decision on this problem. So the quick answer is it's a little of both, but I would put a really heavy emphasis on just an honest characterization of uncertainty. And the managers have to essentially decide whether or not um, they want to, whether or how they use a model to inform those decisions. 
Okay, thanks, Martha. So we have five minutes. I'm going to try to get as many questions and answers in as we can. And again, we're committed to, and there's questions in the chat we're not going to get to. We will answer all these questions, at least to the best of our ability, and we'll reach out to Martha. I'm sure we'll do this offline. So if you don't get a chance to speak now, question, we're not ignoring your question, but let's just keep going. So I got Parker, Bob Black, and we'll see how far we get. Go, Parker. Hey, Martha. Parker McCready here. Uh, Parker. Thanks for your talk. Hey, can you talk just like a few sentences about the money? Like, where did the money come that allowed you to make this progress in the science and, and the conversations with managers? That's a really good question. So the answer is, um, I think that there has been sustained federal and state funding to get the models off, off the ground and rolling. Um, but ultimately what, you know, the science partnership has been super proactive in going after competitive grant, um, grant money um, to be able to keep things rolling. And I think we've had variable success in that. Um, uh, and that I would look, if I were you guys, I would look towards models that I think that they have in San Francisco Bay in which they've worked cooperatively um, with their uh, with their sanitary agencies to identify a pool of research funds that can be um, essentially sort of a committed funding stream to really move this program along. Because ultimately for us and the money that we have, I feel like we have some gaps in what we're able to do just because what we're running is largely a research show and, and not a well-supported sort of modeling program. Thank you. Thank you, Heather Trim. <laughs> Hi, Heather. Heather, oh, great. Hey, oh, in. good. Can you hear me? All right. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, Heather, Oh, good. I can, can tell on my phone. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm wondering if you could give us a, a, a sort of quick um, uh, stats on the status of the sewage treatment plants in the bite and also up the watersheds, which ones are at advanced treatment and which ones are still at secondary. So I know wow. that, like, for example, in the LA River, I think there's nine plants. What is the status of all of them? Um, and just kind of, can you give us a picture of where the plant, the facilities are right now in their treatment levels? Sure. The answer is um, maybe like a big picture. So in in our sort of coastal export of nitrogen, 98% of the nitrogen exports to the coast are point sources, and about 90% are direct discharges to ocean outfalls. Um, and then among those plants. Um, which are the municipal wastewater treatment plants, um, most are at secondary um, with, no, with no nitrogen management that's being required. Um, and there are some along the coastline that have gone farther. And so I applaud their efforts and some have actually um, moved to advanced nitrification, denitrification, but for the most part, most are at secondary. Um, within our, our rivers, then, there are some really great examples of over the last 20 years that some of the inland plants have gone to um, advance nitrogen removal, um, nit nitrification, denitrification, and, and um, we can actually see in our modeling um, um, some of the big changes, uh, the reduction in primary production um, that's occurred as a result of those, those wastewater upgrades. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, Ron, Tom, you got the last question. Okay, thank you. Um, great talk. Uh, hi, Ron. And, uh, <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, I, I'm really intrigued by the uh, resilience aspects of your work and, and uh, in particular, uh, looking at restoring kelp and eelgrass as well as the watersheds. Is that in its infancy in its work or is there a, is there a place that I can go to find oh. out what's going on? That's a really good question. So the answer is, um, I think that the um, the management conversations are in their infancy um, in in California, but we've already been working on the modeling tools um, to support um, a characterization of how, for example, kelp um, aquaculture um, can make a difference. And so I will um, run. I'll put the. Um, some examples of published papers and points of contact in the chat so you can follow up with those people. Um, 
but I think it's it's definitely something that there's a lot of interest in. We're just trying to figure out um, how, you know, what is the most uh, sort of effective way of having those conversations with managers. All right. Thank you so much. Great. So we're going to close this part of the session. Mark, thank you very, very much. That was spot on and really interesting. And I think it's going to really influence a lot of the thinking in this in this region. And it's nice, it's nice to know that we're sharing problems and perhaps some, some solutions. I do think that we've we've been Thanks, talking guys. informally about you know SQRP and and uh, the San Francisco Actuary Institute PSI forming a more um, uh, active collaboration among those three organizations because we do share a lot of common interests. So so thank you for that. We Thanks are. Very much, you guys. I am so if we were all together we would applaud loudly. I don't know how you do that on Zoom. That's one way to do that probably. But thank you, Martha. We really do appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Marielle, who's going to take us into the breakout discussion. Great. Thank you all. If we go to the next slide. Um, we're going to very shortly move you all into the breakout rooms based off of what you signed up for when you registered. Um, as Stefano mentioned earlier, these are really just a teaser to the conversations while they build on previous discussions in the region, like the Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy and the Nutrient Forum. Um, and try and take a, a next step in some of those conversations. We will not have all of the answers by the end of this hour. And so they are intended to jumpstart that and they will help to inform the workshops that we are gonna do later this fall on each of these technical uncertainties where we get to dive in a little bit further. And so this helps us flush out, who else should we be talking to? What are some of the key questions and opportunities to move the needle when it comes to these topics? Um, so that we can make the most use of the time between now and this fall um, in offline conversations, as well as in the, the breakouts. Um, and so it will probably take us a couple of minutes just because we've had some folks register this morning, which is great to get you assigned. But do want to note that in the breakouts, we ask that you stay in one breakout um, just so that we can have the robust conversation there. And each of these will be structured a little bit differently, just kind of based off of where the conversation in the region is around these topics. Um, and so, but generally, there will be a teaser from one of our experts um, just to be a thought starter and get some wheels turning, an opportunity to ask them some questions, and then a, a discussion question from there. But again, at the start of the conversation, please feel free to add things in chat to follow up with Stefano and I directly as well. Um, the workshops are one of many ways in which we can have these discussions. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the magic button that will send you all to breakout rooms and get the some of you who are not assigned there. And then we will come back at the very end just for quick five minutes in terms of highlighting a few next steps. Great. So. To wrap up, as we mentioned earlier, all of these breakout discussions are a starter to a series of workshops we're going to be reconvening this fall. Um, you'll see that we've narrowed down to the particular week uh, for each of these, but we'll be locking in the dates as we coordinate with speakers um, for those. So please continue to keep an eye on our website. Um, we also have, as you may have seen when we registered, a listserv for these conversations in particular. So we'll share updates there as well. Um, we, in these workshops, are excited to continue on the discussions we've been having today. But as we mentioned, those are not the only way in which you can engage. Please feel free to reach out to Stefano and myself as well directly. Um, also, if there are people, programs, or studies based off the conversations we just had that come to mind that you think are important context for these discussions, send those our way as well. Um, over the next week or so, we will kind of package up all the materials from this discussion, from the presentations to the recordings, and also really kind of summarize the, the conversations. And we'll post that on the website, but we'll also email that out to everybody who attended today and or who registered, um, because we recognize that it's not just about having the scientific conversations, but also making sure that the science is shared um, within our community more broadly. With that, I will hand it over to Joel for just some closing thoughts. Thank you, Marielle. I just wanted to thank a few people, all of the